everybody. Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn, and it's my great honor and privilege to get to share this grace encounter with you today. As always, I would like to invite you to subscribe and then like and share. Help spread the good news that Jesus is Lord, the head of all principality and power. And that means that the reign of Lucifer has reached its expiration date. And people need to know what is going on in this time of great shaking. Did you know that Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last days for you? That's what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. And what you need to take away from that is that you and your welfare are not just an afterthought to God. He's very deliberate and relentless in his love for you and his desire to bless you. Decree with me. God is for me, not against me. And I will be a good steward of the manifold grace of God who delights in mercy. This is the day of salvation, and I will stand still, expecting to see his glory cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Oh, I just, mm, <laughs> I love to think about that. Scripture references for those statements of faith are found in Romans 8, verse 31, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, and Numbers 14, 21. I know that in just a casual looking around or in constantly being bombarded by the things that are coming uh, through the media across a lot of pulpits, uh, it's easy to get to thinking that there's no hope. It's easy to fall over into dismay and discouragement. And that's the reason that I share the things that I do on this broadcast to help people understand you're only hearing part of it <laughs> and the part that's actually destined to turn out exactly the way God says. That's what I want to share with you, to give you lasting hope, something that you can sink your teeth into, be able to stand, and be able to point other people in the right direction. All right, today, I want to read to you out of Psalm 24, verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> this is a Psalm of David. Remember, David is a prophet. Many times, that as he would begin to praise the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord would move upon him, and he would begin to speak prophetically of the Lord Jesus Christ, and those are called Messianic Psalms. Psalm 24, verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Now vanity is from the Hebrew word shav, and it means not only vanity, but idolatry. That's the basic idea behind it. When they talked about vanities, they were thinking idolatry, because those idols are just vain. I mean, you could talk to them, but they couldn't help. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Well, in case you didn't know it, you've got eye gates, ear gates, and a mouth gate. <laughs> and when you lift up your head, and that's what he told us to do in these last days when we saw these things coming to pass. Look up, lift up our heads. Why? Because he's wanting to invade, okay? Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty in battle. Mm. Glory is from the Hebrew word kabod, and it means the splendor, the weight, glory, and honor. So it's that manifest presence of his goodness, his grace, becoming so heavy that it literally starts becoming physically visible and felt and experienced. It's not just 
a word. It's not just a religious cliche. It becomes a very tangible thing. So who is this king of glory? Now, a lot of people think of Elvis as being the king of rock and roll. That means in his era, nobody could outdo him regarding rock and roll. Jesus is the king of glory. And we want to remember that that's what he is the king of. Who is this king of glory? Strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Now, what I want you to notice here is the connection of the glory and warfare. Okay? Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, your everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Oh my goodness. He's emphasizing this for a reason. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Selah. Well, hosts is from that Hebrew word, uh, sabah, and it means a mass of persons organized for war, soldiers, host, army. So when who is this king of glory, the Lord of hosts, put it down somewhere in your Bible, in your margin, if you've got room. He's the Lord of the angel armies. The king of glory is also the king and the Lord of the angel armies. So the glory of the Lord is mentioned here in context with the angel armies and with war, him coming in to take care of business. All right. Let's look at Psalm 97. And I want to read verses 1 through 7. The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. So here we've got this picture of something to do with warfare and his enemies being destroyed. His lightnings enlightened the world. The earth saw and trembled. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. So here's his presence being manifest. The heavens declare his righteousness and all the people see his glory. So we've got his enemies perishing before him. We've got uh, his presence being manifest. And then we've got people seeing his glory. And then verse 7 says, Confounded be all they that serve graven images and that boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all ye gods. Confounded is from the Hebrew word bush. I like to say that, bush. <laughs> and it means to be ashamed. To be confounded, disappointed, or delayed. Well, why are they ashamed? I went, when you're face to face with the Creator and the manifestations of His power and His presence, and you realize you've been talking to a rock or a piece of metal, time to be ashamed because you're face to face with reality as it really is. It's no more these lies and deceptions that the enemy has spun and these delusions and images that he's planted in people's minds that have deceived them to the point that they think that it's profitable to pour out drink offerings to a fallen angel and to a piece of stone or wood. Ugh. Yeah, they're going to be ashamed. All right, let's go on over and look at another reference. Psalm 149. Notice the connection between the glory and Warfare and angels of the Lord and the presence of the Lord being manifest. Psalm 49, verses 5 through 9, the scripture says, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Do you think, I mean, honestly, do you think it's going to be possible for the saints to not be rejoicing when the glory of the Lord's being manifest? Uh -uh. <laughs> They're going to be joyful in glory. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud up on their beds. This signifies being at rest, being involved in worship, experiencing the glory of the Lord. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. So we worship in God and we fight in the enemy. Okay. Why is that sword in their hand? To execute vengeance upon the heathen, punishments upon the people. Now we understand as new covenant people, people are not our enemies. We wrestle against principalities and powers, wicked spirits in heavenly places to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, 
to execute upon them the judgment written, This honor have all saints. Praise ye the Lord. Mm. So again, we see glory and warfare. And the word that's translated chains there in that particular passage, it means to shoot forth like fire. So we're talking about chains of fire. This is spiritual warfare. You do not fight a physical battle lying on your bed. And you don't do it with praise. Okay, This is spiritual warfare. And this honor have all the saints. That's the reason that I'm trying to get people to understand that what God is doing in this outpouring of His Holy Spirit, this move of His Holy Spirit in these last days, that everybody in the family of God is to be involved. There is no sitting on the pew and leaving the responsibilities of confronting the enemy to the hands of only the pastors, the teachers, the evangelists, the prophets, and the apostles. No. Every born-again child of God, this honor have all saints is to deal with these fallen angels and put them in their place and help with the cleanup as the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord. So again, we see the connection between glory and warfare. Now, with all of that in our thinking, I want us to look at Isaiah chapter 28, verses 5 and 6. In that day, now, as I've shared with you before, I've mentioned this several times in previous broadcasts. Anytime you see in that day, always back up and see what day it's talking about. Get your context. Well, in this instance, it goes back two or three chapters. And we find out, and I believe it's in chapter uh, 23 or 24, that it's talking about a time when the earth is shaking, that it's reeling. So it's in the time of the shaking of the heaven and the earth that day. And then we find out that it's during the same time that this is when he's punishing the host of the high ones. He's bringing them down. He's bringing down the lofty city. So this, this Babylon, the spiritual Babylon, everything connected with it, they're a target. And then in uh, 27, he talks about this during this time that he punishes Leviathan and the serpent that's in the sea. And so it's dealing with these fallen angels, these unclean spirits, all of this in that day. This is what the context of this is. It's a time, uh, Isaiah 28 is talking about when he pours out this storm of, of his spirit. And in that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. Now, we've been noticing the connection through the glory, warfare, and the presence of God being manifest. Okay? So he's going to be a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. Why is he so insistent that he's going to do this? Because we've talked at different times about other scriptures that talk about the glory of the Lord being manifest on his people and in the earth. A crown of glory. He's not talking about some beautiful something or other that's sitting on our heads. Everybody can go, whoo, when we walk by. I mean, that may be part of it. There may be... Uh, some evidences, and well, the scripture definitely says that his glory is going to be seen over us, but it's not talking about a physical crown. The Hebrew word that is used here is Adaral, and it means crown, but the root, Atar, means to encircle for defense or attack. Okay? So he is going to be, think of an invisible force field that covers you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet and completely encircles all the way around you. That's your crown of glory. That glory is his manifested weighty presence, the kabod. Okay? That is what he's crowning us with right now in this outpouring. He's doing this for a reason. Verse 6 says, For a spirit of judgment to him that sits in judgment, and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. Now, God delights in righteousness and judgment. Judgment is from that Hebrew word mishpat. That means the sentence, the verdict, or the formal decree. I've done several teachings recently on the fact that as we put his formal decrees that he has already written in this word against these fallen angels, that's what we're supposed to be doing as the family of God in this earth, as the kings and priests. We're not just wearing the team t-shirt and strutting around with the crown on. We've got a responsibility, a job to do. And as Jesus spoiled the principalities and powers, Colossians 2, 15, he stripped them of their legal rights, but he gave authority to the church to bind them 
and to loose things that they have had bound. So this is what we're supposed to be doing. And this ugh, church is not about just attending meetings to see what new outfit everybody's bought. Church is a governing facility. And we are supposed to be governing as kings and priests under Christ Jesus and getting things set right that the enemy has made wrong. So, he's a spirit of judgment to them that sit in judgment and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. I've shared with you the scripture in uh, Psalm chapter 25, I believe it's verse 9, where he said, the meek he will guide in judgment. He leads us. We don't, we don't jump up and start judging these situations in our own strength and our own intelligence. We wait to be led by the Spirit. But what he does by the Spirit is he will point out things in his word that apply to specific situations and he will quicken that to our hearts. And then we speak that out and he releases the angels of the Lord to take care of it and we move on to the next situation. He's also strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. Strength is Geberah. It means force, might, power, strength, and valor. Why do we have to turn the battle to the gate? Well, because the destiny of the seed of Abraham is to possess the gate of his enemies. Genesis 22, verse 17. We know from the book of Galatians, chapter 3, and verse 16, and also verse 29, that that seed of Abraham is Christ Jesus. Yes, Isaac was initially, but the whole purpose was to get Jesus in this earth. So he could crush the enemy's head, strip him of his authority, strip him of his rights. But we also find in Galatians that verse three, uh, chapter three, verse twenty-nine, is that we are part of the seed of Abraham because we are in Christ Jesus. So we have a part to play in this. So he's strength for them that turn the battle to the gate. Matthew sixteen and eighteen says, "The gate of hell shall not prevail against the church." And Peter had just received and expressed the revelation that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. So we understand that that rock, that foundation upon which the church is built, is the revelation of Jesus. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against that. Because when you understand Jesus is the Son of God, He is the head of all principality and power. And because of His perfect obedience, we've been made righteous. Because of His perfect obedience, His name is above every other name that is named. And it doesn't matter whether it's Baal or Baal's above or uh, Vishnu or any of them. They have to bow to Him. Why do we need to possess the gate? Because we need to block the access of fallen angels to our planet and to our people. We need to slam it in their face, seal it with the blood of Jesus, and say, no more. Okay. But more on that later, maybe. In Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, the scripture says that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Biblical hope is not just longing for or wishing but is a strong, confident expectation of good that's based on the promises of Scripture. Now, how many people do you know who are actively rejoicing, expecting the glory of God to be manifest just any minute, that they're so convinced that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is covering this earth as the waters cover the sea, that they're expecting it? Well, it's time we begin to cultivate that attitude. Let me read you out of Romans chapter 8. Verses 16 through 22. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed in us. Here we go, talking about the glory again. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, why are we waiting on the manifestation of the sons of God? The scripture tells us that when Jesus was manifest, 1 John chapter 3, it was to destroy the works of the devil. Creation is suffering because of devil's meddling. The book of Isaiah chapter 14 tells us he made the world a wilderness. For the creature or the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. 
because the creature or the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. So Satan and his angels have corrupted everything. They've made the world a wilderness. But all creation knows that something is going to happen when the glory rises and the sons of God are manifest. This is what God is preparing us for. But you need to understand. And the reason that I have shared these particular passages with you today is that the presence of that glory him crowning us with that glory, it's not just for defense. It's also for attack. And I've been sharing with you that we are being moved from defense mode to offense mode. We're being moved from survival mode to arrival and revival mode. Things are changing. This is a great time of transition and if you don't have your ear open and listening to what God is doing, if you're not watching and seeking for His wisdom, you're going to miss out on some crucial elements that, that it's not His will for us to miss. He's doing things, and we want to be in agreement with Him, speaking in agreement with Him, moving forward with Him as He does. All right. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 19 through 21, and then straight on into chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense. So here's warfare. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Cue the glory. <laughs> when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. His words in our mouths. Well, what is judgment all about? The mishpat, judgment of God. It's about uh, executing the sentences, the verdicts written through formal decrees. And God's already decreed against these fallen angels. He ruled in favor of humanity at the cross and against these unclean spirits. And it's time now for those judgments to be executed. And so then he says, chapter 60, verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And what happens when this happens? And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. So can you see why Satan is in such a state of hysteria and absolutely just doing double backflips? trying to distract and trying to prevent people from pressing into the pouring out of the Spirit of God and asking for it and desiring it and positioning themselves by the grace of God to walk in it. Because it's going to mess him up. Oh, and it's going to pull people out of the areas where he has had them blinded. It's going to empty out. His kingdoms, the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord. He cannot escape that. His time is up. He has been judged. Now he shall be cast out. He cannot escape it. But since humans opened the door that gave him rulership over this planet, humans are going to be the ones that shut the door or gate and boot him off. But they're going to do it by the Spirit of the Lord. Mm, let me bless you. The Lord bless you and release his glory to rise upon you and be seen over you. The Lord grant you vision of victory and call forth you forth into your destiny. The Lord bless you and protect you and your family from all evil. The Lord hasten to perform his word to revive you and raise you up and cause you to flourish in this era for his glory and honor. May you live to be at least 120. Hope you said amen. <laughs> it's to your benefit if you do. You get in agreement with those things. God loves to perform them for you. Let us pray. 
Father, we thank you for the awakening that's taking place. We thank you that you are opening the eyes and the ears of our understanding to perceive your plans that you've got for your family during this time. We thank you that you're helping us to grow up and be able to acknowledge and accept the responsibility of reigning as kings and priests and that it's not this romanticized thing that we've had in the back of our minds about after you come and the millennium reign and we're walking around with crowns and sitting on physical thrones that there's so much of it that's got to be done by faith now. Thank you that you've ordained that we be able to walk by faith and war by faith and live by faith instead of by our feelings and by what we see and hear and feel happening around us. Your ways are good. Your ways are right. I'm so thankful that you are a God who loves righteousness and judgment and that you delight in exercising loving kindness and righteousness and judgment in the earth. Thank you that you are that crown of glory for us, that you are that spirit of judgment against these unclean spirits and that you are strength for us to be able to turn the battle to the gate. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to lead us in this because we don't know what we're doing, but we are so happy to submit to you to seek your wisdom and let you lead. Thank you, Father, for the good plans. Thank you for the outrageous displays of the miraculous that you've got ordained for this time as you cause people to remember and turn unto the Lord that the scripture may be fulfilled. We receive it in Jesus' mighty name. And we thank you, Lord, for your great love. Amen. Well, all right, dear friend, I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day, and I'll talk to you later.